The Las Vegas Jane Doe, 1986, also known as Cave Girl. This still unidentified case came to me via email from a subscriber named Christine, who has been dedicated to this case since 2004. She submitted possible matches to the coroner, but so far there hasn't been a match. She also had some interesting insight. This young woman was found in what was described as a cave in the desert outside of Las Vegas, but it's really not so much a cave as it is an abandoned mine tomb. The young woman didn't appear to be homeless, although in some posts it suggested she was. It's clear she'd only been in the tunnel for a short time. She'd recently got her hair cut and colored, and it looked professional, which somewhat conflicts with the idea of thinking that she was homeless. Additionally, there was no food or water found in the area. There was some clothing found nearby. However, there was no clothing on her body. She was unclothed and partially underneath of a blanket. They were unable to determine her cause of death, but she had no drugs or alcohol in her system. There was also no outward signs of trauma. But the fact that she wasn't dressed, had spent money on her hair, and had no food nearby seems to indicate that the idea she was living there is suspicious. Additionally, there was only one sock and no underwear found at the scene at all. She was around five foot six and 92 to 112 pounds, which is pretty thin for her height. Her hair was around six to nine inches in length. She'd had some dental work done and none of her teeth were missing. They also knew she had at least one child. If they were right, and she was 25 to 30 years old, that would place her date of birth 1956 to 1961, and it would mean her child had been born prior to 1986. She was wearing Willie Country brand jeans in a size 9. She appears to have worn glasses with rims with plastic frames that were somewhat see-through. She also had with her a plastic Colgate mouthwash bottle and kissing stick brand lip gloss, as well as a book of matches. There was some belief that she was from the area, but Christine had a good point that Las Vegas wasn't the size then that it is now, and it's always been a tourist trap. There were around 400,000 residents there in the 1980 census, and while that's not tiny, they would hopefully have known if someone went missing from Clark County at the same time. A huge complicating factor is that Vegas is, and always has been, a draw to people from other areas for both vacation and work. She truly could have been from anywhere. Christine speculated that the blanket may have come from a hotel or motel, along with a small bottle of mouthwash, and I think she has a pretty good point. Carl Koppelman did this recreation in 2017. One other item of note is that they said she had multiple stress ulcers in her stomach. Stress ulcers are multiple superficial erosions that occur after shock, sepsis, or even some kind of medical trauma or chronic illness. They can also be caused by physiological stress, and the inflammation can be exacerbated by acidic food. The Las Vegas Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 36 years. The Angel of the Meadow, 2010, Manchester, England. On the 25th of January, 2010, Construction workers were working at an abandoned car park on Miller Street in Manchester City Center, and that place is known as Angel Meadows. It's a pretty old area. Some of the park had gone unchanged since the 1960s. The area is described as pretty gross and is said to contain more than half a century worth of debris in some spots. The construction crew suddenly came upon a rolled carpet. It had been rammed between the fence and a wall and as the years went by, piles of dirt settled upon it. Much to their horror, they realized it wasn't just a carpet, but there was a person inside. It was the perfect spot for someone to have placed her not to have her be found for a while. Dirt kept landing on top, and it was a hiding place within a hiding place. The examination suggested she was 16 to 30, 155 centimeters to 179 centimeters tall which is 5'1 to 5'7, and she wore a size 12. She'd been receiving dental care, but her upper right premolar was missing, 
and it would have been visible to those who saw her smile. She'd been beaten and had fractures to her jaw, neck, and collarbone. She was wearing no clothing from the waist down, leading police to believe she was assaulted. They also believe she was born between 1950 and 1954. Usually I try to figure out possible dates of birth, but in this case, this one was figured out by the police, and it's a smaller window than their age estimate might suggest. They think her life was taken between 1975 and 1988, although she wasn't found until 2010. So I would take that date of birth with a grain of salt. If they don't know when she passed away, I don't know how they can say that. Near her was a white plastic Guinness measuring chart, which was thought to be used in pubs. It was also uncovered along with a cut piece of orange carpet. The plastic Guinness chart dates back to the 1960s. The police worked this case hard, and in 2012, Jane Doe's DNA was obtained, and over 400 missing people have been ruled out since. They also have the DNA of the person who did this to her, but so far there hasn't been a match. If there are photos of the handbag that was found near her, I haven't found them, but it's noted that it was empty. Anyone with any information on this case can call Crime Stoppers at the number listed. The Angel of the Meadow has gone unidentified for 19 years. The Twiggs County John Doe, 2003, was found in Twiggs County, Florida. Not a lot has been released about this case, though an article was run locally calling the case very solvable and it's true that they were able to do a recreation that may also help identify this man. He was around 5 foot 7 inches tall, and likely of Asian or Hispanic descent. They believe he was 25 to 43, which would mean he was born 1960 to 1978. A military fuel truck was traveling to Savannah, Georgia, from Macon, Georgia, and it found itself accidentally overturned in Twiggs County spilling gallons of fuel out on I-16 West, right before the Sagoda Road exit. This happened about 14 miles east of Macon. As awful as this is, it was a blessing for this man. During the cleanup efforts, human remains were found. The man was skeletonized and had been spread throughout the area. It was clearly not an accident, as some of the remains were partially buried. It appears that scavengers were responsible for unearthing what was found. The Twiggs County John Doe, 2003, has gone unidentified for 19 years. The Newcastle County John Doe, 1993. The Newcastle John Doe was found off Marsh Road near I-95 in Brandywine, near Wilmington, Delaware. They believe he was either of Native American or Asian descent. Around 5'9 to 5'11, he had heavy tartar and nicotine deposits on his teeth, so he may not have been getting regular dental care and was likely a smoker. That said, however, he didn't have any cavities. He was likely 20 to 40, which is a pretty large gap. That would give him a birth date of 1953 to 1973. His DNA has been entered into CODIS, but there has been no match so far. This is why family members submitting to NamUs is so important. It's the quickest way for identification. The Newcastle John Doe was wearing brown slipper shoes with rubber soles. He had multiple items of brand name clothing, including a Ralph Lauren shirt, tan bugle boy pants, and had a seven-digit phone number that was written on one shoe and that number appears to possibly be the number of a Domino's Pizza in Brick, New Jersey. He was also missing the tip of his ring finger on his right hand. Whenever he lost it was much earlier, as the stump of his finger was well healed. It also appears he may have had a neck injury in the past. They also noted that the right thumb and pinky finger had extra long fingernails, and those nails were well groomed. In his front pocket, he had a piece of tissue wrapped around three unspent 38 caliber bullets. Someone had blindfolded him and then wrapped and dumped him off the side of the road, although it doesn't say exactly what he was wrapped in. His cause of death isn't listed. 
He'd been where he was found for several weeks prior to being located. If you know who this man may be, please call the number on your screen. The Newcastle John Doe has gone unidentified for 26 years. The Imperial County John Doe, 2003 the remains of a man were found in Ocotillo, California on October 2, 2003. They believe he was a Hispanic male, around 20 to 40. He had photos in his wallet that might suggest he was a husband and a father or perhaps an uncle. They believe he was a Hispanic male in his 30s to 40s, which means he was born in 1963 to 1983. He was possibly from Mexico, as he was found in the Ocotillo Mountains which is a route currently traveled by individuals from Mexico planning to cross over into California. He had a wallet with the name Avila Torres carved into it, and another word that appears to be Reina or Rana. The photo of the kids reminds me of photos I've had taken at Walmart and Sears when my kids are little, although my backgrounds didn't include Winnie the Pooh. The chair they have the baby in appears to be standard for mass picture-taking services, like you might find in a department store, as well as the background. He wasn't a tall man, maybe 5'4", and it appears he'd been deceased about one month when he was found in 2003. Someone out there is missing him, and hopefully someone at some point will recognize the people found within these photos. The Imperial County John Doe, 2003, has gone unidentified for 18 years. The Broward County Jane Doe, 1982. A young woman was found in Deerfield Beach, Florida in 1982. She had a heel fracture of one vertebrae in her mid-back, and it may have occurred as a result of a car accident or a fall from a height greater than 10 feet, or perhaps a direct blow. However, this didn't happen at the time of death as it had healed. She wore a size 32 and was wearing a striped pullover sweater as well as a gold necklace that had a brown bead every two inches. They believe she was between 11 to 20 years of age, and this would mean she was born between 1962 and 1971, likely more toward the earlier date than the latter. She was 5 foot 5 and only around 85 pounds. This is really a low weight for her height. She was found floating face down in the Rinker Rock Pit Pond. They believe she'd been there for several weeks. This does make me wonder how accurate the weight estimate for her is because of the time she'd been there. So if somebody is missing somebody and the weight looks wrong, I would take that with a grain of salt. It's just that this is such a low weight for 5'5". Five five. It's perhaps why they think she may have been on the younger end. Kids these days seem to grow taller sooner than they did back when I was growing up. But this was 1982. Anything is possible. I'd love to know what you think. I personally wonder if she isn't in her mid-teens to 20. Assuming age 20 is the max age. It's possible she was homeless and hadn't eaten in a while, or it was a younger girl who was experiencing a growth spurt. The Broward County Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 40 years. The Washington County John Doe, 1998, also known as the Webb Hill John Doe. On December 7, 1998, three teenage boys were hiking near Webb Hill in St. George, Utah, when they saw a shirt sleeve flapping in the wind near the top of the hill. They had been told by their parents to not climb anywhere up there, near the rock cliffs. However, they were too curious not to, and they felt they had to investigate. It's likely others had been hesitant to climb up into that area themselves because when they got up there, they found a man who had been there 75 years or more. It's a little staggering to think of how easily someone can go undetected. It was a young man who at that time should have had his whole life ahead of him, but life wasn't easy back then. Not that it's easy now, I guess, but they had things a little harder. He had wear on his boots that seemed to indicate he traveled to where he was on horseback. He was young, often referred to as 16, but he's also listed as being 14 to 17. He had a fractured left hand at some point that had healed. He also had 13 ribs on his right side, even though 12 pairs is the norm. His right arm was super developed, 
which means he was probably a heavy industry worker, perhaps working as a miner to support his family. It was clear whatever he did was very physical. Back then, it was normal to start working at a young age, and around then, child labor was increasingly considered important to industries under the guise of advancing the wealth of the nation. This was less prevalent in Utah, however, which is where he was found compared to the eastern United States. They were finally starting to crack down on young workers around that time, trying to protect kids who were being forced to work. Sometimes the kids were the sole support of the family. Even after all this time, they were able to tell the young man had been suffering from a pulmonary infection. That means either one or both of his lungs were severely inflamed and likely filled with fluid. That may have caused a fever, chills, or maybe pneumonia. He was wearing two shirts, a jacket, and had a silver belt buckle. His Marshall Field boots were sold through a catalog in 1917. The Webb Hill John Doe has gone unidentified for 23 years, but he's likely gone unidentified for 100 years, if not more. The Lee County John Doe, 2001. This man was struck by a vehicle on Interstate 75 near Bonita Springs, Florida. He appears to have been Hispanic, had black hair, brown eyes, and he was missing his right ring finger, which had been amputated during his life. He was short of stature, around 5'5", and 145 pounds. They believe he was 21 to 35, which would mean he would likely have been born around 1966 to 1980. If you have any idea who this man was, please call the number listed. The Lee County John Doe has gone unidentified for 21 years. The Werfano County Jane Doe, 1999. This young woman was found wearing a band's former brand sleeveless crop top in a size medium. She had Wranglers and a sports bra. She had on men's thermal underwear with the Winston cigarette logo on the back, as well as dark brown sandals in a size 9 or 10, and those were made in Italy. She was 5'7 to 6 feet. She was likely white, Hispanic, or Native American, and it's possible her hair was styled in dreadlocks. A man from Albuquerque, New Mexico, wrote a letter dated August 10, 1999, and he sent it to authorities saying he discovered a woman's remains three weeks earlier inside of an old abandoned refrigerator in a secluded area about four miles off Exit 56 on Red Rocks Road near Walsenburg, Colorado. I always include in my videos an approximate date of birth if I can. Missing from this case, however, is an estimate of how long she'd been inside the refrigerator. As a result, please take this with even more of a grain of salt than usual. Assuming she'd only been there for a short amount of time, her date of birth would be 1954 to 1969. But I doubt this is accurate, as she would probably been there longer. They do mention that the refrigerator was lying on its side, with a door partly open, and the remains were skeletal. They had been scattered by scavengers there was trash inside of the refrigerator, and that was dated 1988 to 1992. So likely she had been there since 1992. That would change her possible dates of birth to 1947 to 1962. But of course, those are estimates that are rough to start with. The refrigerator itself was a Philco brand, likely made between 1940 to 1960. It had a lever handle and was a single door unit. It's also important to note that her teeth were out of alignment to the point that it's noticeable. Her case is being treated as a homicide, but if the cause of death was determined, it wasn't listed. The Warfano Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 23 years. The Bernalillo County Jane Doe, 1996. On May 2nd, 1996, a jogger was running near a vacant field near 98th Street near Tower Road in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The area was underdeveloped, and they believe she'd been there for two to four days. She'd been wrapped in a dark green or black plastic garbage sack, securing the wrapping with copper-colored electrical wire. 
The bottom of the bag was tied with a white rope. They believed she was either white, Hispanic, or Native American, and that she was 14 to 19 and about 5'2 to 5'4. This would mean her family's looking for somebody who was born around 1977 to 1982. Her life was taken at the hands of a beating, but they couldn't find any evidence of any other type of assault. The Bernalillo County Jane Doe, 1996, has gone unidentified for 26 years. The Cook County Jane Doe, 1994. The Cook County Jane Doe was a young woman found murdered on May 24, 1994, in Chicago, Illinois. The young woman was found wearing almost no clothing in an alley behind 4837 South Champlain Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. She'd been indecently assaulted and strangled. The working theory is that it was a serial offender named Gregory Klepper who took her life. It's believed he was active between the years 1991 and 1996. And of the known victims, this young woman is the only one still unidentified. It's unclear if she was, in fact, what's been referred to as a working girl. Despite Klepper's claims, it's possible she may have been offered a ride or just simply abducted by him. She had black hair, worn in a ponytail, with a black ribbon, brown eyes, and pierced ears. She had a six-inch scar that was located on her abdomen. This indicated she'd likely given birth at least once. There is a post-mortem photograph available on NamUs that's pretty clear and it looks a lot like the recreation here. She was likely just 18 to 22, which would place her date of birth around 1972 to 1976. She wasn't very tall, maybe 5 foot to 5 one. If you have any idea who she may have been, please call the number on your screen. The Cook County Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 28 years. The Cook County John Doe June 8, 2018. This John Doe's remains were discovered in an abandoned home located at 9635 South Genoa in Chicago, Illinois. He'd been dressed for the winter, which would place his death in autumn or winter of 2017. They were sure he was of Asian descent, but the other estimates are pretty wide, suggesting he was aged 40 to 80, height 5'4 to 5'11 and that would place his date of birth between 1938 to 1978, which is just so wide. The long sleeve t-shirt he was wearing was a size 4XL, but it's unlikely he was actually that size, and it's unclear how well it fit him because he was also wearing a button-down style shirt that was size 34 or 35. His drawstring pants were a size large. He was carrying a green lighter. The Cook County John Doe 2018 has gone unidentified for four years. The Cook County Jane Doe, April 28, 2005. This young woman was found in a vacant wooded lot in an isolated area near some railroad tracks. It's believed that she was there for up to seven years. So that would place her date of birth from 1980 to 1993. It just depends on how long she'd been there. It's important to remember this is always an estimate, and they don't always know how long somebody's been there, which, even if they're guessing the right age, could affect when the date of birth was. Strangulation is listed as her cause of death. The Cook County Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 17 years. The DeKalb County Jane Doe, 1993. This young woman was found behind a building on Ranchwood Drive near La Vista Road and Interstate 285 in northern DeKalb County, Georgia, on September 17, 1993. This is yet another life taken by Larry DeWayne Hall. I always try to decide how much to say about serial offenders. Their names keep popping up and it's hard to avoid them, but the last thing I want to do is contribute to their notoriety either. And I don't want this kind of thing to boost my channel. So in this case, I will say that there are at least 45 women during the 1980s and 90s who lost their life in accordance to this man who was traveling around to Civil War memorials. This specific psycho 
grew up digging graves, and it's believed many of his victims haven't been found. And there are a lot of victims known already. He is currently imprisoned in North Carolina. He'll never see the light of day. We know that she had extensive dental work, including a gold bridge that was permanently affixed in her mouth, and two gold crowns. Her upper teeth were fused to the metal crowns. She'd also had a full hip replacement that repaired a fracture to her left hip. A stainless steel orthopedic plate was present on her left femur. Based on the surgery to do all this, it's believed that at some point she had a pretty major traumatic injury from perhaps a long fall or a vehicle accident. She also had osteoporosis and low bone density, as well as a lack of muscle mass. This young woman had long, curly, light brown hair, and it appeared to be frosted. But as someone who did this, This is not the same thing as the highlights you see today. And I think that's why it specifically said frosted. Someone who is maybe younger and doesn't know what this is, they would put our hair in a cap and pull it through with what looked like a crochet hook. I'm mentioning this now because the way she would look in pictures that people would have of her at home, her hair would probably be pretty light. Or at least I know I have dark brown hair. And my hair was almost white blonde in some spots because they keep pulling the hair randomly through it again and again. And so the same hair might get highlighted many times. In fact, I showed a picture of me with frosted hair to somebody else not all that long ago. And she didn't know it was me. She wanted to know who it was. It could change somebody's appearance. So depending on when she started doing her hair this way, she might look a lot different than family might remember her. Her shoes were a woman size 8, and she was likely 20 to 40 years old, around 5'4 to 5'7, and around 115 to 140 pounds. The DeKalb County Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 28 years. The DeKalb County John Doe, 1991. This one is a little bit strange, as they were able to locate his car, but it wasn't the lead they'd expected as it turned out he'd been using a fake identity. He was found in a rural area near Hendricksville, Alabama, and they believe he was 18 to 25. He was likely either white or of Native American heritage. He was around 5'11 to 6'1, and he was likely there for around four months before he was found. The young man was found suspended from a tree with the suggestion that he took his own life. The contents of his car just caused more questions about what he was involved in, and it's just my two cents, but I think sometimes the police are quick to arrive at a conclusion that there wasn't foul play. And I realize it's hard to know what happened, and it's hard to investigate if you don't know who somebody was. But there's enough sketchy things with this case that he might have had people after him. And I personally question the conclusion in this case, although, I mean, it's not about me, but I'd love to know what other people think. There isn't any indication that they checked this out to see if it might have at all been foul play. It looks like it was dismissed pretty quickly. But it is worth noting that sometimes people set it up to look like it was at someone's own hand when there actually was foul play. I don't know. I'd love to know what you guys think about this one. The car seemed to be a pretty big break at first. And while there was no identification near him, the police realized They had impounded the car that he'd been driving. It had North Dakota license plates, and inside was a Pizza Hut receipt from 1991, a phone number of the St. Benedictine's Abbey, and not one but two Washington State birth certificates. What was alarming about this is one of those certificates was completely blank, and he'd purchased the car under the name of Damon Hunter, but there's no indication that's actually his name and it probably isn't. In the end, the car led to way more questions than it answered. In fact, they did realize that somebody had called that number, the one for St. Benedictine's Abbey. It's a monastery located in Atchison, Kansas. It was founded in the mid-1800s, and it involved Benedictine monks who dedicated their lives to their religion. I suspect this means the young John Doe is probably Catholic, or was involved in the Catholic religion at some time. And they remembered the call, 
they were able to share that he had called to receive counsel about financial problems and threats that he said he and his family had been receiving from someone who wanted to hurt him. And to me, that just further causes questions as to whether or not he took his own life. He appeared desperate, and he admitted he considered robbery and foul play to pay off his debts. Though it's unclear if he actually followed through, they didn't find any robberies he'd done. It does also lead to questions about who it was that was after him and what they were willing to do. And that threat to his personal safety is also why I question this conclusion. It was believed he was 18 to 25, which would make his date of birth around 1966 to 1973. Also inside the car was a note that was full of threats. It was that note that made authorities believe he did, in fact, become involved with at least one robbery. Despite all of these leads, people were never able to identify the young man. The DeKalb County John Doe has gone unidentified for 30 years. The Prado Jane Doe, 2007. This is an interesting case as it involves a woman who likely didn't come from the country where she was found. I want to apologize up front for any mispronunciations. I very clearly can speak only one language, and I'm trying. In this case, the Prado Jane Doe was found hanging from a tree in the Via di Cavigliano in Prato, Italy, in 2007. A passerby happened to discover the woman who was suspended from an olive tree along the field in Tuscany, Italy. I'm not sure about the recreation I found. Something seems off about it, but, but the only other photo I'm finding is a post-mortem which I don't show out of respect for viewers and the people involved. I would recommend searching if you think you know who she is. There is an additional layer to some of these cases, where the person seems to be in a country they did not originate from, making it nearly impossible to identify, and this is one of those. The police were called to the scene saying she'd been there since 4 to 7 a.m., and they'd found her around 9 a.m. that day. A large bin was found nearby, and they believed it was used to hoist her body up. A bag was found near her, and her woolen coat was laying folded at the base. In the bag were scientific journals and a French greeting card that was signed by someone named Roberta and Michael. She also had inside the bag some potato flatbread from a bakery located in Tuscany, as well as a soft drink, vitamin supplements, and an official envelope belonging to the Danish royal family. And the envelope dates to Queen Ingrid's court letterhead. She was the Queen of Denmark until 1999. There's some indication it might have been unused, which made them think she might be part of the royal family. Additionally, she had a postcard of Turkey. The postcard had not been mailed, which may have indicated she'd come from Turkey. She would end up being buried in a grave marked Unknown or Ignota. They checked local hotels, but no one was reported missing and there wasn't any luggage found there from somebody that had disappeared. Her DNA was taken and it was run in 2009, which at that time was just two years after she was found, but it led nowhere. They did run it through databases through both Europe and Canada in hopes of finding a missing person. That same year, they got what they'd hoped was a huge break. From San Marino, Italy, came forward to say that he met her at a conference in Florence at the Villa Viviani. He recalls her because she was wearing unique sunglasses, which were apparently found with her. But I can't find a photograph of those sunglasses to show to you. He noted that she had many scientific publications with her throughout the conference, and he noticed she had a notable foreign accent, although he didn't say where he thought that accent originated from. When he spoke to her, she only responded in single-syllable nouns, so it's possible she didn't speak Italian at all, or if she did, it was not much. He did state the conference was pretty prestigious, and it was invite-only. Neither she or the doctor recalling spoke at the conference, however. They were simply attendees. All they could come up with from that time is that she had purchased a potato flatbread from a bakery nearby that she hadn't consumed. He was able to report that she had an interest in computer science, and they did try to investigate that link, hoping she'd been to Prado Linux Association, which was local, but no one remembered her ever visiting. 
they did forward her image to other technological organizations nearby. She was described as being well-groomed and wearing makeup at the conference. However, it was noted that she'd been sweating excessively at the conference and had removed it. And when she was found, she did not have makeup on, although her nails were painted pink and she had blonde hair. Her shoes originated from Poland. Her wool coat had what was described as an Eastern European tag. She was also wearing leopard print headband and white framed sunglasses that had a tiger stripe pattern and was a brand named Venetic. She also had with her 20 euros and a map of Vancouver Island in Canada. And the map was written in English. They believed her to be 50 to 60, which would mean she was born around 1947 to 1957. She also had a coupon with her to subscribe to the Scientific American, and it had been filled out for Enric Ice in Payson, Arizona, with a credit card payment crossed out. That man does exist. He is a doctor located in Denmark that specializes in laser dermatology. There was also a luggage tag for Norwegian Airlines, but without the name filled in. She had quite a bit of things with her, and I would encourage anyone who might have information to search out the Italian articles on the case. I tried to cover the most important points. The Prado Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 14 years. The Philadelphia John Doe This man was estimated to be 16 to 30 when he entered the men's bathroom and into a stall at the 30th Street Station in Philadelphia in 1994. This is an underground subway train station. He went into a men's bathroom stall and took his own life. It was a self-inflicted wound to his head with a 25 caliber weapon that had been stolen from a Wisconsin residence in 1985. The only thing with him was a handwritten note reading, with gloves on his fingers and blood on his toes, he will have music wherever he goes. Don't F with the dragons. It was really bizarre and completely puzzling. They think he likely was not from Philadelphia, but that he instead may have come from Canada. He was possibly 16 to 30, either Asian or Hispanic, and probably around 5 foot 9 and 170 pounds. This was in 1994 so this means he would have been born around 1964 to 1978. They know he had a round scar on the back side of his right knee, brown eyes, black hair, and they observed small, snake-like scars on his face and neck. There is a post-mortem picture available on NamUs. It's also noted that he was circumcised. His feet were a size seven and a half. If anyone has any idea who he may have been, please call the number given. The Philadelphia John Doe has gone unidentified for 28 years. Cinnamon Doe. This woman had been hanging out and socializing in the area near where she was found in Key West, Florida. She went by the name Cinnamon and it appears she never told anyone what her real name was. She was eventually discovered in what was described as a derelict cabin cruiser that was found floating about 150 yards north of Rat Key, which is near Key West. An anonymous tip came in from a man who said she was his girlfriend and that she'd been suicidal and her name was Cinnamon. It certainly wasn't helpful. She was wearing swim trunks and a cut-off tank top, which had a pink flamingo on it. She had a rope necklace with a glass amulet that was attached to a coiled wire and a bracelet with one bead on it on her right ankle. She wasn't very tall, about 4'10 to 5'3 and about 140 pounds. They depict her as being 33 to 60, which is pretty wide. That would place her date of birth at 1939 to 1964. It's suspected that she died of alcohol poisoning. Cinnamon has gone unidentified for 22 years. The Garfield County John Doe, 2004, also known as the Flat Tops John Doe. The Garfield County John Doe was discovered in White River National Forest, which is located in Garfield County in Colorado. He was 5'11 to 6'2 and estimated to be between 27 and 65. 
which would put his date of birth in the range of 1939 to 1977. He had with him quite a few items, and they may be helpful to help identify him at some point. He had a notebook with a note written to someone named Lib, although this is perhaps a nickname. Much of it is unreadable, but it includes the statements such as, I should write in case my situation here doesn't improve. This may be the end of my journey. Would like for you to claim the body, and then something unreadable. Then something about services or memorial, and the word cremation. There's something extra emotional for me about the idea that he apparently knew he was in trouble. He fully expected, it seems, his identity to be known, and he was planning what somebody he knew would do with his remains should he pass. But the notebook was pretty damaged, and not enough could be made out, if his name was on there at all. It doesn't appear he considered ever that he might become a John Doe. He had a green spiral notebook that had a hand-drawn depiction of a heart with figures inside, one of which appeared to be a cat. Some of the other words are third choice, take them up in a glider, I promise not to get sick on you, which appears to be about scattering his remains. He also asked someone to call someone else. The sleeping bag he had said Perth, Australia on it, and this led them to think that perhaps he wasn't from the U.S. Two elk bow hunters came upon his remains in September of 2004. He was skeletonized and inside his sleeping bag. His bag was located inside of a tent. It wasn't clear how long the campsite had been abandoned, but he had most likely passed away a full year before he was found, maybe even two to five. His pants had almost completely rotted away, so it might be on the older end of it. In addition to being around six foot tall, he had extensive dental work that was clearly expensive. He'd had work done on almost all of his teeth, and he had a pack of camel, unfiltered cigarettes next to him. He'd been wearing Timberland hiking boots, and those were a size nine. He had some serious degeneration that was evident in his back and his neck that indicated he was probably in a lot of pain day to day. It isn't clear if he was camping or just homeless. He had placed duct tape on his socks to block holes, so he may have been living in the wilderness for a while. He had an empty bottle of Tylenol pain reliever, a Jansport backpack, razor blades, and earplugs. If he was homeless, he wasn't without money because he had with him six $100 bills and $30 in other denominations. The sleeping bag was a Slumberjack brand. He had with him a dome tent, a butane stove, two fuel cans, a water filtration kit, military-style canteens, and other camping equipment that you wouldn't find with a casual camper. He also had two National Geographic moisture-proof trail maps of the Flat Top Mountains, and he'd drawn a route across them. He was found within the route he had highlighted. He also had with him a four-in-one Radio Shack game and pocket-sized battleship. Among the other random items was sunglasses, reading glasses, a magnifying glass, and a pair of binoculars. The flat tops John Doe has gone unidentified for 17 years. Joy Nybauer, Boca Raton, Florida. Joy Nybauer was likely 20 to 30 when she made a choice to take her own life. She was found on November 27, 1996, and while she went by this name, it's unclear if it's her legal name. They tried to confirm it, but they were unable. She would likely have been born between the years 1961 and 1976. She was found on the 3800 block of North Ocean Boulevard at Spanish River Park by a local lifeguard. She was tall, around 5'10", and was likely white. She weighed around 175 pounds, and she hadn't been found for about five days. As a result, she was deemed unrecognizable. She had given her name to a police officer earlier. She told him her name was Joy Nybauer, and she gave a birth date of 7-12-1966, but she never provided proof that was her identity. The officer gave her information on the local shelters, and he offered to give her a ride to one, but she refused. 
That is the only person who recalled speaking with her, so it's possible she was from out of area. Joy Nybauer has gone unidentified for 25 years. Sarah Sarah was the possible name of a woman who died by taking her life by jumping off the Arthur Lang Bridge on the North End in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. She didn't jump into the water, but rather onto the off-ramp. But the impact didn't kill her. She was taken to a hospital, but she didn't make it. Inside of her pocket was a page ripped from a photo book that listed local social service agencies, saying they were traced to Abbotsford, Port Calquitlam, and Whistler. One of the phone numbers had the name Buzz alongside of it, and he remembered meeting Sarah. He recalled meeting her, but he didn't know her name. An employee from the Queens Avenue United Church believes that Sarah had stopped by their soup kitchen around three weeks before. The police went from shelter to shelter, and they found more people who remembered her. One said Sarah had been kicked out of her home by an ex-boyfriend, and she tried selling her body to make money to get by, but that she couldn't do it. She said she didn't want to be a part of that life. It all seems to imply she was suffering and trying to get by, so perhaps she felt so beat down that she felt like she had no other options. It also highlights how important social service programs are, because once people get in a position where they feel beat down, no one should feel out of options. The fingernail on her right index finger was missing, and she had no drugs or alcohol in her system. They also note that it doesn't appear she was a past drug user. She did have small, silver round eyeglasses. She had a scar on her upper left arm and one on the back of her right hand. Sarah has gone unidentified for 22 years. The Los Angeles John Doe, 2004. Identified as Edgar Eraldo Gonzalez, this case is a little different than the ones I usually cover. Edgar was found suspended in an alleyway after taking his own life. It's likely he was either a teen or a young adult, and he went unidentified for 16 years. The only clue to his identity were multiple tattoos found on his body, but they led nowhere. He was wearing a t-shirt for the heavy metal band Pantera. Instead, it would be a fingerprint that would provide his identity. While we know his name was Edgar Eraldo Gonzalez, his name as file still exists. Normally, they're removed at an identification of a John or Jane Doe. But the reason it's still there is Edgar hasn't gone home. This is because his family has never been found. It's noted that they aren't sure what country he comes from, which may indicate he could be from Mexico, Guatemala, or elsewhere. His date of birth isn't listed. Edgar was 16 to 23, meaning he was likely born 1981 to 1987. If he'd lived, he would likely be late 30s to early 40s now, so there must be someone out there missing him. Hopefully, knowing his name might make it a little easier to find his family. If you know who they might be, please call the number on your screen and help send Edgar home. NamUs has a post-mortem photo if needed. It is case 2514-UMCA. Edgar went unidentified for 16 years. The family missing him would have been missing him for 18 years. The Fairfax County Jane Doe, 1993. Fairfax County is in Virginia, and our Jane Doe was found there in 1993. She was discovered in a shallow grave about a year after she passed. She had extremely poor dental health, and it was noted that she hadn't seen a dentist in some time. There was a gap between the two front teeth that showed significant decay. It was clear she'd had some sort of cosmetic filler applied to her teeth originally, likely to counter the gap in her teeth. She had an overbite, and five of her molars were missing. There was a lot of staining on her teeth, which seemed to indicate she was a smoker. She had on ripped bikini underpants and wore a 34B bra, which had been rolled up and placed by her. She had on white sandals that were size 8. The sandals likely mean she died during the warmer months of summer. There is a note of aqua-colored swirls in her pierced earrings. She had with her a red hair pick and a yellow banana clip. A quarter was found in the victim's pocket dated 1980. As a result, they believe that was the earliest year she could have been placed in the grave by whomever took her life. They noted she'd suffered knife wounds to her back, 
collarbone, and neck. It's possible she was attacked from behind. She is estimated to have been there 1 to 15 years. She was 15 to 39, and assuming she lost her life in 1980 to 1992 at the latest, that would mean she was born between 1941 and 1987. Othram Labs is currently working on this case. The Fairfax Jane Doe 1983 has gone unidentified for 28 years, but she is likely someone who's been missing for 40 years or more. The Adams County Jane Doe. Her remains were located in a field near 54th Avenue and Marion Street in Brighton, Colorado, which is a suburb of Denver. They placed her age at 18 to 35, and they believe she'd been there for about a year, which would mean her date of birth was around 1959 to 1975. She was 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 4, and either white, Hispanic, or of Native American descent. Unfortunately, this is all the information they have. The Adams County Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 28 years. The Arapahoe County John Doe, 1982. It's always shocking how many ranchers find human remains, leaving me and probably all of you to wonder how many people out there aren't found. In this case, he was inspecting a field about four miles east of Byers, Colorado. There's an indication he might be an indigenous man, but it's listed he might also be white. We do know he was 5'10 to 6'2 and around 170 to 190 pounds. If he was in fact 40 to 60 when he passed away, he would have been born in 1917 to 1942. He would have gone missing in late 1981. He had brown work pants, a tan and brown vertically striped shirt that had short sleeves, and he possibly wore a white baseball cap with Kicking Horse Job Corps written on the front. The Kicking Horse Job Corps Center is located in Ronan, Montana, but the people at that center were unable to identify him, and they don't know how the hat was obtained. Ronan, Montana is located quite a ways away from Byers, Colorado. The Kicking Horse Job Corps is operated by the Flathead Nation and is connected to the Salish and Kootenai tribes. About 6% of Montana is comprised of indigenous people, or around 78,000 people. So it's possible the man is of Native American descent. But it's also hard to know for sure which sovereign nation he would have even been a part of if he is. Colorado has less of a Native American population than we have here in Montana. It's about 1% of their population. So perhaps he may have come from Montana to start with. Also note that Wyoming is in between the two states and they have about a 3% population of indigenous people, which is around 21,000. Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado are probably the three likeliest states for him to have originated from. The cause of death hasn't been disclosed. We do know that he wore glasses and had dark frames and that they had electrical tape on the nose and earpieces. The left lens was missing. A tobacco can was found nearby. The Arapahoe County John Doe has gone unidentified for 40 years. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. If you could help to get the channel noticed by the YouTube algorithm by liking and leaving a comment, even if you can just leave a thumbs up or some emoji, it counts as engagement. It would be so appreciated. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Thanks everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other.